Well, here we are. It's 2016, no? And I'm, it's so good to see so many of you, I have to say. There's something very, very sweet about it. You make New Year's resolutions? You don't, you don't have to raise your hands. I know some people do and some people don't. It's 5776 in the Hebrew calendar year, also known as the Gregorian calendar or the Christian calendar as the Western calendar. But it's the calendar that's faced by most of the world today. And that's why everybody was either doing something tonight, last night, or watching television, or somehow ringing in the new year. I have to tell you, in 2001, when I knew I was leaving New York to return back here to Los Angeles, I had never gone to Times Square in the 15 years that I lived in New York. So I figured my wife and my kids were actually out here visiting family. So I thought, you know what? How can I leave New York having never gone to Times Square New Year's Eve? So I went down to Times Square around 8 o'clock at night. By the way, it was one of those days like those teeth cl clattering days. It was like 20 degrees and windy. And the way it works, any of you been there? OK, a couple of you hearty souls, so you know. So what happens is, is I think the ball drops at 47th, if I'm not mistaken. What they do is they fill in an area. There are stanchions. And once that area is filled in, then you, don't, you can't go in there. You have to go to the one that's the next one that opens up. So the later you get there, the further you are away from where the ball actually drops. So I got there at 8 or 8.30 at night, which is still three and a half hours in advance. But of course, by then, I was all, all the way down to 53rd, 52nd or 53rd Street, still pretty close. There's only like about, at the time, 300,000 people between me and the ball. OK, that's fine. But I'm shivering. I'm really, really cold. And it's here, this is how cold it was. On the stage deli on 7th Avenue, there were icicles hanging down, frozen solid. It is an image that I will never forget. Frozen solid. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? This is not a pleasant experience. But I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to wait it out. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I became a hearty New Yorker. And I, right, Mom? Right, I, I call my mom. I can take anything. 10.30, 11 o'clock. And I'm thinking, I'm an idiot. This is not what I want to be. 11.30, 11.30, I leave. I, wa I run, oh, oh yeah, oh, like I wimped out, I wimped out. How many of you were there? <laughs> I could, maybe it was 11.15, Jackie, but whatever it was, I, I walked briskly to the number one train. There was no number nine in those days, because this is before the World Trade Towers were taken down about two months later. Um, that's another story. I took my children to the top of the World Trade Tower on, on July 20th or something so that they could remember, have a view of the city in which they were born, right? Who, who knew? Anyway, so I walk briskly to the number one train, take it up to my apartment on the Upper West Side, get into my nice warm apartment, and watch the ball drop <laughs> in comfort of my home. Right? And I made a New Year's resolution that I wasn't going to do that again. So in any case, <laughs> I hope you don't think it's chutzpahdick of me, but I want to make a suggestion for a New Year's resolution that we should all consider for the coming year. And it's a bit unusual, probably not what you'd expect, because I usually talk about our obligations as Jews, what I think are the, the Jewish passions to make a better world, which are con quite concerned with how we treat other people. But this is a very Jewish New Year's resolution. In fact, it's from the Talmud, the Palestinian Talmud. But nevertheless, it's very Jewish and very important. And this is what the Palestinian Talmud teaches. It says that in the world to come, in other words, in the afterlife, and yes, Jews believe Judaism affirms an afterlife. In the afterlife, a person will have to give account of every legitimate pleasure he or she deprived themselves of in this life. Let me just repeat it. It's the words of the Talmud. A person will have to in the world to come, in the olam haba, right, the next world, a person will have to give an account of every legitimate pleasure he or she deprived themselves of in this life. In other words, when we leave this world 
at the end of our lives and, meet, we, and we meet with God in the next world, each of us has to account to God for every legitimate pleasure we deprived ourselves. Pretty heavy. Two key words, legitimate, has to be a legitimate pleasure, and deprived, didn't take advantage of. Why? Because God gave us this world to enjoy. And those legitimate pleasures that we didn't enjoy, in a sense, are an affront to God. So here's my suggestion for a resolution for each of us in the coming year. This year, observe mitzvot, do good things, give tzedakah, try to minimize gossip, volunteer your time. I know many of you do many of those things and more. Devote yourself to other people and I want you to be sure to enjoy your life. One year from now, when we come together, God willing, I want you to say I spent this year, part of this year, doing for others, but also doing for myself. Make a resolution, a resolve, to take of every advantage of every legitimate pleasure that's reasonable for you to experience. No one is advocating here that we do something that's financially irresponsible. If we can't afford to do certain things, we shouldn't do it. But those things that can bring you joy, and by the way, many of them do not cost money. I'll talk about that in a moment. We should do them, and we should feel some sense of urgency to do them as well. Rabbi Harold Kushner, by the way, Rabbi Harold Kushner is going to be here on February 2nd. You know him probably from his book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. He's written 14 or 15 other books, including one that will be out in about three weeks, but because I'm having a dialogue with him, they sent me an advanced copy. It's the nine essential things I've learned about life. I have had the privilege of, this will be my fifth dialogue with Rabbi Kushner since 1992. It was the first one. He was one of the first people I had the privilege of spending time with this way. He is, and I, I, you know, I really try to choose words correctly or honestly, he is a modern day sage. He is an extraordinarily insightful man. So if you're free February 2nd, come that evening, okay? It'll be really, really, really special. So he shares an important insight on this issue of living life. He writes that as people come to the end of their lives and they come to the realization that maybe they won't be living a lot longer, and they reflect back on their years. Yes, they all want to make the next big birthday, the one with the zero or the five. Yes, they all want to be there for the great, great grandchild's bar bat mitzvah. But to paraphrase him, Rabbi Kushner says, it isn't so much that people fear death. It's that people fear having not lived. I have to tell you, what's the most popular Jewish phrase? L'chaim, it isn't just mean to life in the sense of another day. It's to life, to live. It's celebratory, to life. And one of the real privileges of the rabbinate is that I often meet with people who've lost a loved one. And sometimes people will say they lived an extraordinarily full life. Well, that's one thing I hope that we would all want to be said about each of us, that we lived a full life. I am aware that every single one of us has challenges that we face. Maybe you're dealing with a health issue. Maybe you're dealing with a health issue of a loved one. Maybe you um, are having troubles because you have to deal with an aging family member, an aging parent. Perhaps there are serious financial concerns. Maybe your life just isn't exactly what you anticipated it would be like. By the way, very few people would say, I don't know anybody who would say, their life ended up being sort of what they expected it to be. And then all this time we wait for things to get better and we wait and we wait and we wait and then it's too late. Don't wait too long. Remember, it's every legitimate pleasure in life. Okay? You can't just do what you want to do because it sounds like a cool thing to do. You do it because it's a legitimate pleasure. There's a sweet story 
of a rabbi and a Catholic priest and they're having lunch. And during the lunch, the priest says to the rabbi, he says, he says you know, rabbi, and they were talking about pleasures. He says, you talk about pleasures. He said, when are you going to finally break down and have a piece of ham? He said, why would God create something so delicious if he didn't want you to enjoy it? And the rabbi turns to him and says to him, well, father, you're absolutely right. I will at your wedding. So <laughs> <laughs> If you can travel, this is just one example, and you want to travel, and you can afford to travel, God didn't create the rest of the world for you not to see it. It's a statement of respect to God to enjoy those things that God created. And if you can afford to purchase certain items, again, this is after you've given tzedakah, after you've done good for others, not instead of, but if you can, then do it, enjoy them. And, and here's where I think this is so important, and an example of why I think it has not, little to do with finances, although that certainly makes it easier, I don't want to minimize that. Find some enjoyment in your daily life. You know, one of the keys to enjoying life is that no matter what the circumstance, try to live it as fully and enjoyably as possible. Enjoy the people around you. If you go to a wedding, then dance at the wedding. Do you know that it's a mitzvah to dance at the wedding? It is literally a mitzvah. You're supposed to dance at the wedding. If you, go to the, if you have someone who you stop in at the cleaners, try to make that an enjoyable interaction. Wherever you are, to the degree that it's possible, I'm not suggesting that if you get pulled over for speeding that you make a joke, although I have to tell you, a friend of mine when I was like 17, did this, gets pulled over. I'm in the car with him, he gets pulled over for speeding. His name was John. And the officer, you know, he rolled down the window. <laughs> and the officer walked up to him, and my friend said, I'd like two hamburgers, a Coke, and uh, do you remember those drive through things? Right? I thought we were going to be, I thought that was the end of it. <laughs> the point here is, whatever you can enjoy, take a moment to enjoy the moment to have the interaction with the people you are in or in working with, talking with, for that daily moment to say something nice and to enjoy it. And that's because you can't just live in life for the highs. If we depend on the very big highs to make us happy, it doesn't work. I know we look forward to certain vacations or to saving money to purchase things, and that's good. But that can't be the way we define happiness. Try to bring it into our daily lives and it will be literally life changing. Don't always look ahead. Say wherever I am at the moment, that day, with whomever I can be, how can I enjoy it? How can I make that happy? You know, I think that Judaism is a religion that prefers humility. There's no question about that but it is also not a religion that elevates asceticism. We don't want people to live with the bare minimums of life. It's there to we enjoy. And by the way, there's a moral component here as well. If we're willing to live with the very bare minimums, then we'll want others to do exactly the same. There's a Jewish story that describes a man who apparently has great wealth, but he goes out of his way to eat stale bread. And the commentary on that is, if he as a rich man is willing to eat stale bread, he won't care if other people eat very stale bread. In other words, when you have had an experience in your life that's good, don't you want others to have it as well? And won't you work for others to live a little better as well? Our world progresses, our world moves forward when those who do well enjoy their lives and feel a responsibility to help others enjoy their lives as well. It gives us meaning in our life to help others to enjoy their lives. But we have a greater emphasis to do that when we take advantage of the legitimate pleasures in life that we have as well. Meaning, by the way, is the key, I think, to happiness, that a whole nother time. So on this, the very first day, right, of 2016, 
I pray that for all of you that the secular year be filled with goodness, may it be a year in which you do good for others and a year in which I hope you are sure to enjoy your life because no doubt that will bring you a smile and that will bring God a smile as well. Shabbat Shalom.